Welcome to the video for sections 32 and 33 of Hansen and Quinn's Greek and Intensive Course. We're covering the optative active. Hansen and Quinn cover it on pages 65 to 67, and they go back to it in the appendix on pages 653 and 658. When you first learned Greek verbs, way back in Unit 2, we talked about how we look at five things in a verb form tense, mood, voice, person, and number. As a review, let's look at each of those things. Greek regularly uses six tenses, present, imperfect, future, aorist, perfect, and pluperfect. You've now met all of those tenses in the indicative mood. Greek also regularly uses subjunctive, optative, which is the mood that is the topic of this video, imperative, and you've started learning about infinitives, and participles are in your near future. Greek has three voices, active, the one we've done so far, in which the subject of the verb is doing the action of the verb, and then there's middle and passive, which we'll learn about in the future. You also know that Greek uses first, second, and third person, just like English, and it has singular, dual, and plural numbers, unlike English, which doesn't have dual. But you also know that we don't use dual very much, and so we're not bothering to learn it right now. Most of the verbs you've done so far are in the indicative mood. We use those verbs for statements of fact or things we know to be true. We also use them in the indicative for questions. But as we all know, much of what we say is not a statement of fact. So we'll need non-indicative moods. We've already had a look at the subjunctive, and this video will introduce the optative. Everything Greek uses the optative for is non-factual. But just like the subjunctive, the optative is used for so many different things that you can't translate it until you know what kind of clause it's in. Unit 3 will give you your first use, that is, purpose clauses, but there will be many other uses of the optative. So you'll learn the default translation for the optative with the different types of clauses instead of with the verb forms. Optative verbs come in all three voices, but today you're just doing the active all three persons, and all numbers. It doesn't have imperfect, pluperfect, or perfect tenses, so we'll only be learning present and aorist tenses right now. We'll also use the future optative later when we need it. With the optative, just as with the subjunctive, tense is about aspect, not about time. So let's get down to learning how to form the present optative active. Everything present, as you know, comes from the first principal part. And we'll need endings to show us person and number. So here's Luo and all six principal parts. We need principal part one. And now we are going to take off the omega, and then we get our stem, which is Lu. We need endings and a chart to put them in, singular and plural, first, second, and third person. And here are the endings of the singular of the present optative active. Oimi, ois, oi. And here's the plural. Oimen, oite, oyen. Accent is recessive. I can't give you a default translation because we don't have any context. But the aspect is progressive repeated for the present tense. Now, before we go on, look at these endings and notice that all of them have an iota in them. This is characteristic of all optative endings. In this instance, they combine with the omicron, and we're used to seeing omicrons in present tense endings, to make those oi diphthongs. And then we've also got some familiar person markers. Okay, enough with the linguistic backstory. Let's make some present optative active verbs. We'll need principal part one, endings, recessive accent, and this nice chart to put them in. 
So let's start with principle part one. Here we have all the persons and numbers filled in with Lu, the principal part stem from Luo. And that is Luo minus the omega. And now we need endings. And they are oimi, ois, oi, oimen, oita, oyen. Now we're going to need recessive accent. You've done plenty of recessive accent now, and I don't need to go through it step by step. Just remember to look at the last syllable, and if it's long, you put an acute over the second to last syllable, and if it's short, you put an acute over the third to last. So here, we had short last syllable in the first person singular, but the other two were long. Wait, you say. Isn't Omicron Iota at the end of the word supposed to be short for the purposes of accent? That is indeed true, but the third person singular present optative active is an exception to that rule. So that last syllable is long and the accent on the verb is correctly an acute over the second to last. So here's the plural with their accents. And again, if the last syllable is short, then the acute goes over the third to last syllable, and that's the case in all of the plural. At this point, in all of the indicative and infinitive videos, I've given you a default translation at, at this moment. But because optative can do so many things, depending on the kind of clause it's in, there is no default translation. You'll learn how to translate it as you learn each kind of clause. Person and number still functions the same way, so you'll still be using I for first singular, you for second singular, he, she, or it for third singular, we for first plural, y'all for second plural, and they for third plural. Let's try it with another verb. Here's our chart and our principal parts of Paideo. We go to the first principal part and put the stem in, that is, the first principal part without the omega. We add the ending and the recessive accent. So we get paideo oimi. Stem, ending, recessive accent. Paideo ois. Stem, ending, recessive accent. And see how the accent is on the penult because the omicron iota, that oi in this instance, because it's present optative active, third person singular, um, that oi is long for the purposes of accent, so it's paideo oi. Then we get stem, ending, accent in the first plural, paideo oi men. In the second plural, paideo oi te. And the third plural, paideo oi en. And that's the present optative active. Let's move on to the aorist optative active. As for everything aorist and active, we use the third principal part. And we'll add endings to show person and number. Here's our friend Luo and the third principal part. To get our stem, first we take the alpha off the third principal part. But remember, the epsilon on the beginning of the third principal part is the past indicative augment and we're doing optative, which is not indicative anymore, and so we must remove it. Once we do, we have our unaugmented aorist active stem loose. And now with our chart for endings, which are imi, ice, i, imen, ita, ian. Look, there are those iotas again. This time they combine with the alpha, which is so often a marker of the aorist, and we get the diphthong I throughout. Attic Greek, though, also has alternative forms for some of these persons and numbers. We have an alternative form for the second person singular, aos, the third singular, an, aia, which can also be an because it can have a new movable, and the third plural, aeon. 
You see, even in these alternative ones, the characteristic iotas of the optative. You'll need to be able to recognize the alternate endings, which appear as often as the I endings, but you can use whichever is your favorite for English to Greek purposes. The accent is recessive. There's no default translation because there's no context, but the aspect is simple aspect, as is usually the case for the aorist. So let's put these pieces together. We get the third principal part, and so here we have the unaugmented aorist active tense stem in all of the persons and numbers, including room for the alternative forms. And now we need endings. So here they come, I, me, ice, I, in the singular regular forms, Imen, Ita, Ian. And now let's do the alternatives. So Eos as an alternative to ice, Eia, or Ian as an alternative to I, and Aeon as an alternative to Ian. Now the recessive accent. Lucy me, Lucice and Lucy. And let's stop a second um, with Lucy because again we have an exception to an exception. We learned at the beginning that diphthongs are long, but that alpha iota at the end of a word is short for the purposes of accent. Well, in the aorist, optative, active, third person singular, right here, it's long. So that acute on the penult is correct. All of the rest of the forms, including the alternate forms, have a short last syllable, so they're accented on the antepenult. So to go to the plural, lucimen, lucita, lucian, and then the alternative forms in the second singular, luceas, and the third singular, lucian, and then the third plural, luceon. Again, I cannot give you a default translation because we don't know how these words are being used or in what sort of clause. Time to show it to you with paideo. We go to the third principal part and start without the epsilon and without the alpha because that's now our unaugmented aorist tense stem. We add the ending and the accent and we get Pideosime. Stem, ending, accent, pideosize. Stem, ending, accent, pideosai. Stem, ending, accent, pideosimen. Second plural, pideosaita. And third plural, pideosayan. But let's not forget the alternates. Instead of second person singular paidel size, we could have paidel seas. So paidel seas. For the third person singular, instead of paidel sai, we can have paidel sea. And instead of the third plural, we paidel sian, we can have paidel seon. That's the aorist optative active. You are now prepared to recognize, memorize, and practice the forms of optative active in both the present and aorist tenses and to use them when we need them.